This is a recording of the 2015th Annual London Lecture on Belarusian Studies, organized by the Ostrogorsky Center in cooperation with the University College London and financial support of the Association of Belarusians in Great Britain. The recording was made at the UCL School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies in London on the 25th of March 2015. The lecturer is Professor Anders Per Rudling from the University of Lund, Sweden. Professor Rudling was born in Karlstadt, Sweden in 1974. He got his first MA from Uppsala University in Sweden, followed by an MA at the University of San Diego in the United States and a PhD at the University of Alberta in Canada. He also is currently a visiting professor at the University of Vienna. Professor Rudling's articles have appeared in the Journal of Belarusian Studies, Nationalities Papers, Canadian Slavonic Papers, and other reputable journals. This year, the University of Pittsburgh Press published his latest book, The Rise and Fall of Belarusian Nationalism, 1906-1931. The title of this year's lecture is The Beginning of Modern Belarus, Identity nation and politics in a European borderland. When I started working on Belarus 10-15 years ago, one of the reasons I started doing that was that there was so little material on Belarus. Here's a country larger than my native Sweden, or larger than the three Baltic republics combined, larger than Austria, as big as Norway and Denmark combined, and there was virtually no books, or very, very few books uh, on this topic. So virtually there's been an explosion in, in literature on Belarus. Uh, and I even had the pleasure now in the spring, I'm going to teach a course on Belarusian history at the University of Vienna, which is sort of, I don't think it's happened before, that is a course dedicated only to Belarusian history. So a lot of things are happening, and I, I'm very glad to have a chance to say a few words about my uh, book that just appeared. I will organize this lecture as sort of a to the force of the beginnings of Belarusian nationalism, the beginnings of the uh, the idea that the Belarusians constitute a people or a nation or that a political project should be organized on the basis on this, this perceived, imagined uh, community. So roughly the period around the turn of the century up until 1920, the period which saw the beginning of Belarusian nationalism and beginning of Belarusian nationalist activity and also no less than six attempts to establish Belarusian statehood between 1917 and 1920. So when I talk about nationalism, I should perhaps do a, a short disclaimer in a sense that uh, given that uh, particularly in the conflict in neighboring Ukraine today, uh, the, the term nationalism uh, has been used very frequently. The name of the leading far-right Ukrainian uh, political organization, the UUN, I'm not using nationalism in that sense. I'm using nationalism here in the broadest possible sense, a movement seeking to establish nation statehood or nationhood uh, for one particular imagined community. Belarusian nationalism is interesting in the sense that it was one of the most recent nationalisms to appear in Europe. Valher Bulhako in his book Belaruski Nationalism argues that it was about 60 to 80 years behind Ukrainian nationalism, which in many ways are similar to the Belarusian case. If the first Belarusian paper appeared in 1906, the first Ukrainian language new newspaper appeared in 1848. Ukrainian tra translated Bible appeared in 1903. The first complete Belarusian translation of the Bible appeared in 1973. So in many ways, the Belarusian nationalist uh, movement followed, in some ways, the Ukrainian model step by step but with some important differences, and, and some, uh, but also some uh, interesting overlap. So it's a, it's a useful model to keep in mind, when, and it was for me when I was working on this topic. The Belarusians were different in the sense that whereas the Ukrainians were divided between uh, two major states, between the Russian Empire and Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and were able to mobilize and organize themselves politically in and socially, in the second half of the 19th century, using primarily the Greek Catholic Church as an important vehicle for national mobilization. This option was not there in Eastern Ukraine, of course, but not also 
in Belarus, pretty much all of which was located within the Russian Empire at, the point, at this point. And the Greek Catholic Church was banned, as most of you know, in 1839, which closed down this particular venue of, 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 of mobilization using, unlike the Poles, which could rely on Roman Catholicism as a vehicle for national mobilization, sort of a surrogate state, both under the, the, so the socialist era, but also uh, in, in the 19th century, Belarus did not really have the option of relying as strongly on religion as could the Galician Ukrainians, because the Belarusians were divided. About 70% were Orthodox, 30%, 25% Catholic. So, so if religion was to be used as a vehicle, it might have the opposite effect of actually highlighting differences in society. And of course, Belarus was one of the least developed, the poorest uh, areas in the European part of the Russian Empire. But so was Lithuania. Lithuania and Belarus at this time was roughly at the same level of uh, economic development. But there was an important distinction that the Lithuanians were largely literate, that the higher level of literacy than the Orthodox Belarusians did. And so did the Roman Catholic Belarusians at the turn of the century. So it is not a coincidence that the number of the national awakeners, the early activists, were indeed Roman Catholics. But for the entire Belarusian region, if you look at the, these gubernias that today constitute the territory of, of Belarus, 6% attended school. And when they did this, they did it in the Russian language, sometimes in Polish. The Valuyev Circular and the Ems Decree restricted in the wake of the, uh, the Polish uprising of 1863 not only the use of Ukrainian but also very severely the use of the emerging Belarusian language. So the normal venues of social mobilization that you had that many other national movements faced in Europe was not really applying to, to Belarus in the same way. This was a state of course as you know uh, that was an autocracy that lacked parliamentary system of government, in even, even representation. And nationalism, Belarusian, Ukrainian nationalist, was suppressed. So it is rather remarkable that when the first Belarusian political party appears, the Belarusian socialist Haramada in 1902, it started very late. But after 1905, the revolution 1905, when it was again possible to use the Belarusian and Ukrainian language more freely, a number of political venues open up. And a particularly important one was the paper or journal, Nasha Niva, Our Field, which appeared in 1906 and came to have an incredible, important <coughs> role in the mobilization of Belarusian national ideology. As Andrew Wilson uh, pointed out in his, in his excellent book, uh, which I enjoyed very much uh, uh, on, on Belarus, uh, he, is point, he was pointing out something which was very often overlooked, this sort of... Uh, origins of Belarusian nationalism in the late 19th century, which did not really develop into full-fed nationalism. Belarusian nationalism was the third national-orientated sort of ideological basis for social mobilization in the region, following the so-called sapado rusist uh, 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 trend, the idea which was promoted by the Tsarist authorities, the idea that the Russian people consist of three branches, the Great Russians, the Little Russians, and the Belarusians. And the idea was that this was promoted as a way, on the one hand, give some recognition that the Belarusians were distinct from the people in Moscow and in, and in today's Ukraine, but still part of a larger community. And it was used also as a way to counteract Polish influences. Another important movement that appeared uh, a little bit later was the so-called Krajowcy, the Krajowość ideology, which was a similar movement in the sense that it emphasized the multi-ethnic, the multilingual, the multicultural uh, legacy and heritage of the Polish First Republic. It identified itself with historical Lithuania, not the Lithuania as we think of today as a Lithuanian ethnic nation state, but rather as a region, as you think of the Midwest in the United States. Lithuania was a geographic denominator. That's why, hence, we were talking about the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, even though Brest today is in Belarus, and for a long time we referred to the capital of today's Belarus as Minsk-Litovsk, as opposed to minsk Matsovetsky. Uh, Lithuania was, of course, a regional, uh, regional identifier. But these two traditions came to contribute and to the development of Belarusian ethnic nationalism, the idea that you can use the Belarusian language as a, as a vehicle for national mobilization.
drawbacks to being the most recent nationalist movement to appear in an area which is already saturated with nationalisms uh, and movements which lay claim to territories, particularly if you perceive Vilnius as your historical capital. Vilnius was the, or Vilnius was the self-evident choice for the Belarusian uh, uh, early national activists. This was a city which they, where National Evil was published, where the mostly Roman Catholic uh, uh, Belarusian intellectuals were active, but it was also a city which Poland regarded as theirs, but a city where the plurality of people were Jews, 43%, and a city which, of course, was located in the Russian Empire and hotly desired by the Lithuanian nationalists as their eternal capital, no less than four overlapping claims, which is not a very good startup situation for a, a, a nationalist movement uh, seeking to establish itself in competition with others. Nashaniva joined, brought together a number of the leading Belarusian uh, early uh, activists, the brothers Lutskevich, Anton Ivan, uh, Janka Kupala, the most celebrated Belarusian author, uh, Jakob Kolas, also uh, one of his uh, uh, co-workers, also a very outstanding Belarusian writer, and <clears throat> intellectuals such as Václav Lastowski, who came to play an important role uh, in the Belarusian People's Republic. All these people uh, came to be identified with these developments in 1918. Journal published not only poetry, not only essays, but also addressed social concerns, political matters, sometimes religious matters, but also had a sort of classical uh, thrust of an, of an education-orientated journal explaining. You have to keep in mind, this was a population in 1906 which was overwhelmingly illiterate and unaware of even the basic methods of organized society. How do you organize society politically? What is a parliament? How do you have uh, political democracy? All those terms needed to be introduced to a peasantry which was unfamiliar with these, these ideas. And they used, even though all of these people were more comfortable writing in Russian, and in most cases also in Polish. There were even some activists that were more comfortable writing in Yiddish than Belarusian. But they chose the Belarusian language, as this was a language which, which constituted the basis for the Belarusian people. So now we have a movement which is based upon Belarusian culture, and rather than seeing it as part of a, a branch of Russian culture or, 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 or related closely to, to Polish. The ideology of the nationalists were socialist, non-Marxist form of socialism, seeking land redistribution and perceiving the Belarusian people essentially as a classless society. This was, was after all, a society which lacked an ability of their own, which had been polonized. Most of the citizens in Belarus uh, consist, uh, consist heavily uh, of Jews, the Belarusians were a peasant community and they perceived themselves and they articulated the socialism in terms of constituting a, a classless peasant society and emphasizing the need for education and the building of economic cooperatives as a basis for bringing about social justice. Nobody really talked about independence yet at this point. This will, this will come later on. And here you have an example of what an article in Nationiva could look like. Uh, this might seem naive today, but uh, it's, it's actually very pedagogically sound. It's explaining the uh, lack of sanitary conditions in Belarusian households, where most people had dirt floors, many people had chickens and cows uh, inside the dwellings in the wintertime, and uh, the sanitary conditions were very poor. Explaining how bacteria works, the need to wash your hands, the reed need to, to keep clean and uh, uh, prevent infections and transmittal of diseases. This is something we take for granted today. It was not taken for granted in Europe before Pasteur uh, 100 years earlier. Uh, among the illiterate Belarusian peasantry, it was still not, of course, self-evident 80 years after it was not evident in Western Europe. So the construction of sanitary equipments in your home, the very, very basic building blocks aiming at building a civic society, a social society in the long run. The problem was, of course, that whereas the nationalists knew very well who the Belarusians were, and what they ought to be and how they ought to organize society, the Belarusians themselves, the Belarusian speakers, often did not. And in the absence, in the lieu of a national self-identification, they often relied on expertise, ethnographic expertise. And this was a tradition which started at the turn of the century and continued well into the Soviet times. So where are the Belarusians? Well, here they're using Professor Yevgim Karski's 1903 map over the Belarusian dialects, which later was perceived as the area of settlement of the Belarusian people. 
So essentially, you have a land here which, unlike many other states in Europe, it was landlocked, it did not have any big mountain ranges, no big monumental rivers to cross, there were no clear boundaries. The marshlands in the south, which were, were sort of uh, uh, impenetrable, but other than that, in, in, in the east and the west, it was not self-evident when Belarusian culture, Belarusian Roman Catholic culture became Polish and, and where the border was to be drawn. So this was one of these step A of the nationalist project of identifying where the Belarusians indeed lived. Two, you need to establish also a language. Uh, Nashaniva started publishing in 1906 in the Belarusian language, but the language of the early issues of Nashaniva is not consistent using various uh, grammatical forms, uh, various uh, and inconsistent uh, uh, orthography and vocabulary, and of course, building a grammar, producing dictionaries were also important building blocks to claim that the Belarusian language was not, as many people had argued in the, uh, still in the 1860s, a dialect of Russian or a dialect of Ukrainian or a dialect of Polish, that it was a language in its own right. And in order to claim status of not being a dialect, it needed to have the attributes which more reputable languages had from the perspective of nationalists. And Branislav Tarashkevich, a very important figure, popularized uh, the Belarusian language by publishing a grammar book in, in 1918, which appeared in a number of editions uh, throughout the 1920s. Another aspect of the ethnographic categorization of the people was to track down their physical appearance. What made them specifically Belarusian? What were their dress codes? What were their physical attributes? How did they look? These were, this was, of course, an area where racial conceptions of, of nations was uh, quite the norm. And there was also a thrust towards racializing the Belarusians, emphasizing that they belonged to different biological composition than many of its neighboring peoples. There were two groups here, one that claimed that the Belarusians were indeed <coughs> Slavicized Balts and emphasized their origins in the Krivici and a number of other uh, Baltic peoples in the, in the early Middle Ages, or others argued that these were Slavs, but they were the purest of the Slavs that had not been polluted by waves of immigration, unlike the Russians, which had a very high level of Mongolian or Finnic blood in them. That was part of, the, of, the, of this argument uh, uh, which, which was used. So a linguistic, a cultural, and also an ethnic biological community. And of course, it's sort of interesting, the, the book stamp on uh, Arkad Smolich's book on Geografia Belarusi that appeared in 1919 was, of course, symptomatically a man planting seeds on the ground and, and building, safeguarding, the, just like this lecture series, I hope, will be like this man here. And we will have been more people, will be hundreds of us next year. And, and uh, the same way Arkad Smolich, publisher, reasoned in those, in those terms. And here was important also, once you establish the Belarusians are not a border people, a border language, a sort of a dialect of Russian or Ukrainian, but the language in its own right. Then you have to also classify the language. And here you have now, instead of this being a border region, you have a map here in, in Smolich uh, Geography of Belarusi, specifying here that here you have the central Belarusian dialects, and then you have dialects that with Polish influence and, and, and Ukrainian influence and Russian influence, but there's a also an established heartland where the Belarusians belong and where they come from. Political development was made more easy after 1906 and 1905, the revolution 1905. But the really big boost to the nationalist project came with World War I, particularly after the defeat of the Russian troops in the Battle of Tannenberg in 1915 and after the German army pushed the Russians out of East Prussia and way back into the Russian Empire and came from 1915 onwards to control a large chunk of uh, what we today refer to as the Baltic states, Poland and also a big chunk of Western Belarus. Before the Germans arrived, the Russian clergy, the Russian Orthodox clergy spread rumors in the churches. They sent out Cossacks to disseminate the rumor that the Germans are an extremely brutal bunch. They rape Women, they bayonet children, they crucify our soldiers, uh, they cut the beards off our priests. Essentially, crude propaganda similar to that, which also you could find, of course, uh, in, in France and Britain and Germany at the time. Uh, similar legends exist about how the Germans treated Belgian soldiers. The result of this in Belarus, in the Belarusian lands, was that this led to an, a panic. And as many as perhaps 2.2 million people left these borderlands before the Germans arrived. 
And the overwhelming majority of these people were Orthodox, Russians and Belarusians. So physically, the boundary of Belarus was pushed back, or the Belarusian settlement was pushed back as much as 200 kilometers as the Orthodox left. When the Germans arrived, they were not the brutes they had been depicted as. On the contrary, they were interested in using Belarusian nationalism, of the Belarusian idea, as a counterweight against Poland. The Germans were literally very surprised to arrive in this region, finding a people that they, many of them had not heard about, about before. Now, these were not Lithuanians, clearly. They were not Poles, but they were also not Russians. They were even at the loss of using it, finding a term to identify them. They used terms such as Stamm or Völkerstamm or Völkerschaft, so meaning nations or nation, nations in the being or ethnic tribes. The embryonic beginning of a people, which could come in handy, particularly as they were all too familiar with Polish nationalism, which was a concern to uh, Imperial Germany as well as it had been to Imperial Russia. So using Belarus or Belarusian national consciousness as a counterweight to Polish claims to this territory might be a useful political tool. And they established schools, they established theaters, they printed newspapers, and they hired their brothers Lutskevich, Ivan Anton, to edit and publish a Belarusian language paper that got a significant distribution in the area under German control. The problem was, of course, that many of the Orthodox had already left, which sort of depleted the base of recipients of the nationalist uh, message. So the timing here was paradoxically not, not right in that sense, but still, if you look at the statistics of less than 6% attending schools in the 1890s, suddenly now had 73,000 pupils instructed in the Belarusian language in 19, uh, 1917, an a tremendous step forward from the perspective of national mobilization, from a nationalist perspective. And this land was known as the Land Oberost. But it was limited to the lands, of course, west of the front. The situation east of the front, which was still under Russian control, was quite different. Here, there was less tolerance towards Belarusian uh, ideas. Another big event here was the Bolshevik, the great Soviet Socialist October Revolution, as it was known, or the Bolshevik coup, depending on your, on your perspective, on November uh, 7, 1917, brought the Bolsheviks to power. Just a few days before the elections to the Constituent Assembly. The elections to the Constituent Assembly, which was intended to set up a constitution for Russia, turned out to be a resounding success. There was no other place in the Russian Empire where the Bolsheviks got such a strong support as in the lands which are today identified as Belarus. In the entire country, the socialist revolutionaries got about 48%. The Bolsheviks got about 23% nationwide, but they were strong in Petrograd and Moscow. But they were also very strong uh, at the front. Many of the people that voted for Bolsheviks in, in Vitebsk and Minsk gubernias, they were not ethnic Belarusians, but they were soldiers. But the support for the Bolsheviks was particularly strong in this border region, uh, given the rather disastrous war. When this happened, that the Bolsheviks took power, Belarusian nationalists now felt that this was a time to act. And it, a few days later, they announced the, uh, the gathering of the All Belarusian Congress. According to their own versions of the past, 1,872 delegates representing all of Belarus got together in the Minsk City Theater. But those who, has been, who have been to the Minsk City Theater realize that uh, they would be physically impossible to fit 2,000 people in that building. Rather, 200 to 600 people is a more realistic estimate and that's closer to the real number. But still, this was an, also a feat of the, of, of, the, of the activists. And they desired, they declared a desire to set up a Belarusian state, a Belarusian army, a Belarusian independence as a clear ag agenda, particularly after the Bolsheviks had taken power in Russia. We now needed to separate ourselves from, from that sort of development. And the Rada was established, a council, which envisioned an army and independence. Now, it wasn't able to operate very long until the Bolsheviks, after they had the chance to regroup, dispelled them physically in December of 1917, and the attempt to establish a Belarusian state all the 1917 came to nil at this point. Those of you are familiar, of course, with World War I, you know you're familiar with the, the Versailles Treaty and the rough treaty imposed upon Germany after World War I, 
and the consequences it had for the radicalization of opinion. But make no mistake about it, uh, had the Germans prevailed in World War I, their peace treaty would have been no less severe. And an idea about this you can get if you look at the, uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which the Bolsheviks signed, which was the conditions, of course, as most of you know, for getting a separate peace with uh, Imperial Germany. Essentially, pushing Russia back to essentially the borders, more or less, of Ivan the Terrible. Pushing them back out to Ukraine, out to the Baltics, out to Finland, and out of Belarus. And now, after that peace treaty, the separate peace, German troops arrived in early March of 1918. When the Bolsheviks being gone, again, the Belarusian activists gathered, and they declared on the 25th of March, exactly 97 years ago today, the Belarusian People's Republic, Belaruska Narodna Respublika, which declared again over all ethnographic Belarusian territories, uh, which in their understanding was an enormous uh, chunk of land from the German border to Bryansk and, and, and Vyazma, a very, very large chunk of territory over which they, of course, did not have physical control, but they declared the aspiration that this is part of our nation, it should be part of Belarusian uh, states. They were mostly Belarusian socialist revolutionaries, and the pro-independence parties in uh, the, the elections to the Constituent Assembly got less than 0.3% of the popular votes. They were not very strong, and many of these activists uh, were indeed Roman Catholics and concentrated to the west of the country. But the conditions now were, was of course different on the German occupation. And they were intensely interested in establishing symbols and making them official. The flag, the white, red, white flag, which had been composed one year earlier, was declared the state flag of the Belarusian People's Republic. The coat of arms, the Pahonia, the symbol of the medieval Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Lithuanian Commonwealth, was made the official state coat of arms. A national anthem was designated, and nationalist activism was greatly, again, increased. The Germans remained loyal to the Soviets. They, once they had the Bolsheviks sign this very harsh treaty, they did not want to break this. And a part of the treaty was that within the land that the Germans controlled, they would not accept the beginning of, of new states, which in the Belarusian case they partly abided by. They tolerated the Belarusian People's Republic. They let them have their flags, they let them have the national symbolism, but they, in fact, did not give them real political power. But here you have the territory over which the Belarusian People's Republic declared uh, their sovereignty. We have two maps here which are overlapping, and the other map is that of the first Soviet Socialist Republic of Belarus, which was declared uh, uh, less than a year later virtually within the, over the same territory, aspiring to e even, even a larger chunk of land. But these two states, I will come to the second one soon, or proto-states or declared state projects, came to have a very important uh, influence on the nationalist imagination. That it was now not seen as a crazy outlandish minority idea that, a minority idea, sure, but you know, it was not a, a, a wild idea that the Belarusians existed and that they had also a uh, right to national aspirations. This map is a little bit, a little bit misleading, but Europe on the 12th of April 1918, this is more outlining the territories aspired, the control aspired by various nationalist movements. The Belarusian People's Republic or the Belarusian Democratic Republic was not recognized by the Germans, but the idea that Ludendorff, the de facto ruler of Germany, envisioned, the idea of a Mittel Europa, of remaking Eastern Europe into a number of small German satellites or puppets revolving around Germany was now started to form. A Polish uh, kingdom was set up. Uh, Lithuania uh, elected a, a German prince, took the name of Mindaugas II. Finland picked a, a prince of Hesse. And uh, Skoropadsky was made appointed hetman of Ukraine. So essentially, this had Germany prevailed in World War I, we could have had, of course, a very, very different development. But even though the Belarusian People's Republic, or the Democratic Republic, did not effectively control the borders. They had an army, but the army was inefficient, and uh, most of the uniforms donated to them by the Poles were uh, either embezzled or did not really materialize into an army. The passports were printed, but there was no border guards to check them. They had no constitution to, 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 to rule the country. But the idea that Belarus exists, and the idea that the physical manifestations of this community should be made widely uh, disseminated was a guiding principle for these, these activists.
they also printed postage stamps uh, without having a postal service, but uh, disseminated them also to, to make the, the Belarusians known. I mean, when I started working on Belarus 15 years ago, still in the 1990s, there were virtually no books on Belarus. You can imagine the situation in 1915 when the German planners were not even aware of, of these people existed. So, of course, this was an, uh, strategically uh, not an absurd thing to do, but rather, rather a logical thing to do, and it followed the steps of many nationalist movements in Europe. When Germany collapsed in November of 1918 and left Minsk in December of that year, the Bolsheviks were about to return. But the Bolsheviks, even though Stalin, the commissar of the nationalities, was convinced that Belarus exists, there is a Belarusian nation, there is a Belarusian people and a Belarusian language, and let him share those ideas, many of the uh, leading Bolsheviks did not, and regarded Belarus as a fiction, a tool in the, in the use of German and Polish imperialism, and were critical of this. It seems reasonable to assume that at least part of the Bolshevik leadership was being increasingly convinced of the utility of recognizing Belarus at least as a political entity under Bolshevik control. So right before the Bolsheviks returned to Belarus after retreating Germans, Stalin issued declarations from Moscow that a Belarusian Republic should be established, a Belarusian Soviet Republic, over the territories of the BNR. And it was declared even before they made it to Minsk. It was declared in Smolensk, which of course also was part of the intended state for both the BNR and for the Soviet Belarusian territory. It would have a capital, it would have its own communist party, it would have its own supreme Soviet, it would have its own uh, party organs, it would have education. They even contemplated in the 1920s the Belarusian language as a, as a commando language for uh, Red Army detachments on Belarusian territory. But as the Red Army was doing quite well and marching further to the west, the plans were changed. Then the next month, this is how the Bolsheviks treated the nationalities question, it was declared that Belarus should be merged with Lithuania, and the Belarusian Communist Party, which only exists for five weeks, was merged with the Lithuanian Communist Party, and the capital was now declared to be in Vilnius. They, an echo of the Krajovos can be, can be heard here. And Vilnius was the capital. But again, once they pushed to the west, then Poland was able to reorganize and push the Bolsheviks back. And soon the Bolsheviks were again out of Vilnius. These two Soviet statehoods lasted the first of 58 days, the other one a few months. Within one year and three months, you have three declarations of statehood. Poland captured Vilnius and came to keep Vilnius uh, through most of the interval period with some short breaks thereafter. And they pushed further east and captured Minsk on August the 8th, 1919, at which point, even in theory, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic ceased to exist. Here was the state of Litbel, again, in the imagination of the Bolsheviks. This would be this territory, Padlyakia, uh, all of Lithuania, and much of Belarus. But it dropped somehow the eastern territories, the claims of Vyasma and, 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 and Bryansk and so on. Uh, but of, co of course, in reality, the situation on the ground looked different. The front ran east of Kaunas, or Kavna. So in, in really, this was a declaration of intention again. Something which you, you can do several times as long as you don't have to follow up with real action or they were not able to do it at this point. The activists of the Belarusian People's Republic or the Belarusian Democratic Republic reorganized in Kaunas under the Lithuanians. Another wing supported by the Poles made it their way to Paris, to the Versailles Conference, and tried to present their case along with the long row of other aspiring nationalism, from Kurds to the representatives of the Orland Islands. The Belarusians was one group in, uh, among many. And they presented this map to the Great Three. This was the state that they regarded as theirs, and made the best case to have this recognized. Of course, they were not received, and this was not respected. Instead, Poland was the state on the rise. And Poland was this point divided between two concepts of Polishhood. How should a resurrected Polish state look? On the one hand, you had a so-called federalist under Piłsudski, who argued that the Polish state, which had been had ceased to exist with the partitions of Poland in the late 19th century, should be re restored, and that Poland should be a multi-ethnic federation under a form of Polish light culture, but also an area which would include Lithuanians, Belarusians, Jews, of course, Ukrainians, under the dominance of Polish culture. Against them stood the so-called National Democrats under Roman Domowski, who were more interested in an ethnic form of nationalism. They played with various concepts, but in the end they decided to have a smaller but ethnically homogeneous Polish state. They received, in the end, none of this, paradoxically. The Polish state that, that came to last came to be an 
a rather awkward compromise determined by the realities on the, on the battlefield. The Curzon line, which was the suggestion by the British, uh, also supported by the French, was of course that the eastern boundary of Poland would essentially follow the place boundary, the ethnographic boundary where the Poles constituted the majority. And at east of that, of that line, of course there were some debates about what to do with cities like Lviv or, or Vilna or Lviv and Vilnius, but in the end this was the offer that they were given. Piłsudski said privately that history won't forgive us if we don't use this chance to take control over these territories. He was, after all, himself a Pole from Vilnius, a city which was historically a very strong Polish tradition there. And he marched further east, and for a while in the summer of 1919, the Soviet uh, uh, Russia was engulfed in a brutal civil war between the Reds and the Whites. Poland was able to march quite far to the east. And by the summer of 1919, Piłsudski's concept of a Poland from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, or the, the Polish Federative State, was not just a theoretical option, but seemed to be something that could actually translate into reality. By the summer of 1919, and for almost a year, they controlled not only Minsk, but also Kiev for some time, until the Bolsheviks crushed the whites and were able to reorganize under the very capable uh, management of Tukhachevsky, who pushed the Poles back very rapidly all the way to Warsaw. Poland essentially had overstretched, and by the summer of August of 1920, the Red Army stood at the outskirts of Warsaw. And it again seemed possible that Poland would be like a day fly and would disappear again. A Polish Soviet government was constituted in uh, Białystok. The survival of Poland was not taken for granted. It had it not been for some miscalculations by the Soviets, trying to divide up the Red Army into two wings, a strike Warsaw, which enabled the Polish forces to strike back. Of course, uh, it could have turned, it, the war could have turned out quite differently. But instead, boundaries established out of the realities on the battlefield and confirmed in the Treaty of Riga. 1921, March 1921, Peace of Riga, which was the last peace treaty of that followed World War I, at least in Europe, which established Poland not as the federation that Piłsudski had wanted, but neither as the nation state that Tomowski's National Democrats had, had, had foreseen, but rather a state which presented itself as nation states of the Poles, but had very sizable minorities of Ukrainians, Belarusians, and others within their, their boundaries. To the Belarusian nationalists, not to mention the Ukrainian nationalists, this was a disaster. Not only did they not achieve the statehood they so hotly had desired, Ukrainian and Belarusian lands were divided between two hostile states, between Poland and the Soviet Union. And in the Belarusian case, an additional problem here was that uh, Poland and Lithuania ended up in a Cold War of sorts. Uh, with Vilnius coming a part of Poland in the, in the interwar period, something that uh, Lithuania refused to recognize and the they wrote into the constitution that Kaunas is our temporary capital, but Vilnius our eternal capital. And for a number of years, up to 1924, the Lithuanian government had a ministry of Belarusian affairs, which was supposed to have at their disposal no less than 1% of the Lithuanian state budget to treat the Belarusians as allies under Polish subjugation and fomenting Belarusian uh, resistance against the Poles in Western Belarus. Of course, they were also supported by the Soviets in that sense. The Soviets were quite delighted to see this rivalry between Poland and Lithuania, and the Soviets also supported left-wing Belarusian nationalism in Western Belarus. This unresolved national issue, this unresolved border issue, came to be manipulated and used, not only by the Soviets, but also by the Polish government, partly by the Germans, and most definitely by the Lithuanians. So Belarusian nationalism, this unresolved issue, was kept. Many interests were interested in, many parts were interested in keeping this uh, conflict going to some. So Belarusian nationalism, I argue in my book, uh, in many ways does not get mass support. Even though it's a remarkable feat, from 1906 to 1918, there was a remarkable growth in Belarusian national consciousness and activism. It ultimately had the support of a small minority, particularly if we, if we were to treat the Belarusian Democratic Republic as a real entity. Most people in the East, in particular in Bryansk and Vyasna, would have very limited ideas of Belarusian nationalists, even who, who these people were who claimed this territory as part of their state. But it became rather a very powerful tool, which was used skillfully, interchangeably, by Germans first, by Poles, by Lithuanians, and by the Soviets. And in this sort of rivalry between mutually hostile states, there was a political space for the Belarusian national activists which they could carve out. 
uh, play these different interests, these different parties against each other. And even though it did not lead to Belarusian independence in the sort of traditional or Belarusian statehood in, in, in the sense of Max Weber, a state which actually controls its border and has a monopoly of power and, and violence, it established a protostate, SSRB, or the Soviet Socialist Republic of Belarus, in 1923 renamed BSSR, was established in 1921 and came to la be the embryonic, the beginning of the state which today occupies the, the, the boundaries it does. And it established also the idea, the tradition of Belarusian statehood. And Belarus is in some ways in many ways unique, I guess all, all societies are unique, but one particularly interesting aspect of Belarusian statehood is that Belarus state remains the only country in Europe with a government in exile. It's a country community which traces two founding mythologies, one being the BNR, which today is celebrated by patriotic Belarusians around the world, and the uh, tradition which was commemorated in the Soviet tradition and is partially still a part of the official ideology under the Lukashenko government. So two rivaling traditions. The BSSR, I guess, could be seen in many ways as a protostate, the beginnings of something. It was, after all, the beginnings of the idea that, that the Belarusians should be organized uh, with institutions of their own. And the BNR, and I guess uh, this is hotly contested, the Belarusian Democratic Republic has been filled with a, a lot of ideology and a lot of meaning to a number of people. And after 97 years of its existence, I would argue that the memory of this uh, political experiment is more important today than it was back in 1918. If it didn't succeed then, it succeeded in establishing a myth which remains important today. Ironically, so did the Soviets. And uh, here we have the two, uh, we, have, we have from there two flag traditions, we have two coats of arms, we have two national anthems, we have two, uh, at least two uh, national days. And uh, I'm sure uh, that Madame uh, Survila in Ottawa, uh, the president of the Bel Belarusian Democratic Republic in exile, will hold a speech today, as, as she use, does every year, uh, to her compatriots around the world. Whereas this day was mostly ignored or treated as a subversive tradition by Lukashenko in the first years of his presidency. Since 2008, we have seen a tendency that Lukashenko is also slowly trying to tap into his tradition and recognizing at least part of the legitimacy of BNR as something that he could build upon. Thank you very much.